A quick question for everyone. Anyone played hide and go seek in the refrigerator lately? <laughs> nope. Uh, I, don't, like, I don't mean like get into the refrigerator, okay? Even though I, my kids have tried that. Um, I mean like hide and go seek in the refrigerator. Like you were craving something. This happened to me a few weeks ago, craving some brownies. Okay, you know, it's quarantine, you know, it does things to us. And so late night craving brownies, go open up the refrigerator and no eggs. No eggs. So then I begin the the game of hide and seek in the refrigerator because they're not in the normal spot. And I know we bought them. Like I asked my wife, I'm like, babe, we bought eggs, right? Like we did the online pickup and we got it. There were eggs. And she's like, I think so. So I get on my phone. I look at the receipt. Yes, there's eggs and we haven't used them unless my like five-year-old and three-year-old are, you know, having omelet parties at 2 a.m., then we should have eggs, okay? And so we pull everything out of the refrigerator in this hide-and-seek game, like empty every drawer, look behind the milk. You find all the things that should have been thrown away months ago. So there is a good part of hide-and-seek in the fridge. And no eggs, nowhere to be found. And so we, we do the responsible thing. We start blaming uh, whoever brought us the groceries to our car uh, from pickup. And then you call Walmart. You're like, yo, we bought eggs, okay? They're not here. We bought eggs, they're not here. Uh, you know, that kid, you know, somewhere along the line, some teenager ruined it because that's, you know, what we blame everything on. And uh, so we are gonna come back and get our eggs. And they're super gracious. They're like, they get a million of those phone calls a day, I'm sure. And so uh, I get, go to get in the car and it's quarantine. So we don't leave very often. Uh, and so I go get in my wife's van and there's this smell in the van. Yeah, some of you already knew where I was going. There's a smell in the van. <laughs> you know, I'm, I, there's always smells in the van, okay? I got four kids. And so this was like a rancid smell. And so you start playing hide and seek in the van. <laughs> and then we open the back hatch and like inside of this little cubby area, eggs. I got to call in great humility Walmart and say, yeah, uh, we'll come buy those eggs that you set out for us. Um, I don't know if you've ever been there, but the reason that I opened up the refrigerator that night to make some eggs and get, or not make eggs, to make brownies and get the eggs, and I didn't find any eggs, was because we never put the eggs in the refrigerator. This is the same philosophy for your bank account, right? Uh, Some of you don't know this, and you should probably take a class, but uh, if you don't put money in your bank account, you can't take money out, okay? You should stop, okay? It's gonna get you in a lot of trouble. I've, I've been there, done that. I talked about that a couple weeks ago, writing checks, okay? So um, let's move on. Uh, this is the same thing in banking. It's the same thing in our lives, guys. If you don't put it in you, you can't take it out. And so the, the premise, the thing we're gonna talk about today from, from Paul's book is this idea of what goes out can only be what comes in. What goes out can only be what comes in. It's a principle in refrigerators, in economics, on your toilet paper roll. It's a principle in our lives. And so today we're gonna engage with this thought over scripture, which is really, really uh, good news. We're not gonna spend the rest of the time talking about eggs or any of that. So uh, we're gonna be in scripture, but before that, let's, let's just pray before we open God's word. God, I'm grateful, humbled uh, to get to open your word with my friends today. I'm grateful that you speak. I'm grateful for the timelessness and the timeliness of your word. God, speak. If you don't, if you don't pierce our hearts, then we're wasting our time just hearing from me. But God, I believe because we are opening up your word, you say it never comes back void, so speak today. Pray this in your holy, humble name. Amen. One of the reasons I, I love getting to teach or, or preach from scripture is that uh, it's God's word. Like I can kind of hide behind it in some kind of ways because it, it's, it's God's word. Like when I get up here or Mark gets up here or anyone gets up here, it's not a message from a pulpit. Philippians isn't a message from a pulpit. It's a message from prison. It's a message from a guy who is literally in prison writing this letter to his friends and imploring them to do things because he believes that it's going to change their lives because the spirit of God has spoken into him. And and what I've come to understand, especially in Philippians right now, is how timeless and timely God's word is. 
We weren't gonna actually be in Philippians way before all this coronavirus started. And we felt this nudge from God to, to move into this book. And I love Philippians. I've spent a lot of time in Philippians, memorized parts of Philippians. I've helped write study guides on Philippians. I took an entire semester in college on the book of Philippians. And, and uh, this time in this season, as I've gone through this letter, um, and God has done a work and is still doing a deep work in my life. And I'm confident that God wants to speak to you today. And the good news is when we use the Bible and why we use the Bible here is because this is not like a, a podcast. This isn't like 30 opinions from a guy and his 30 somethings for 30 minutes. That's not what happens here on Sunday mornings, but we're hearing from the living active word of God. And that is really good news for all of us in here today. But as I've been reading this book and I've been trying to parent and trying to coach and trying to be a husband and trying to be a coworker, God's word has been, it's been piercing me. Like Ryan shared, it's been piercing me in different ways. Or if you are a Gen Z, it hits different. If you have no clue what that means, judging by the lack of anybody laughing, uh, ask a teenager, okay? Uh, but we are going to be in Philippians and we're going to be in the fourth chapter uh, and start in verse eight here. Uh, and this, so this is uh, what's titled up there is Paul's closing appeal for steadfastness and unity. And, and you'll see that after this is 10 through uh, 23 and Pastor Myron is going to uh, be here next week and, and share the rest of that. But for today, we're in these two verses starting in verse eight. Finally, Brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me being Paul or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace is going to be with you. The God of peace will be with you. So these two verses that we're going to explore, they're, they're kind of broken up into two different sections. The, the first one is the, the thought section. It's this whole idea of think and meditate on a specific uh, list of virtues. And, the, and then the second part is the do section. And this is, this is usually how Paul writes. He's like, hey, think about things and then I want you to do it. And the book of Romans, there's like 11 chapters of think about this stuff. Now go and live your life this way. So this is what Paul is doing. It's, it's how he writes and, and he's going to be teaching us this today. And so the, the two are action words. First, we have to think that's an action. And then we have to do. It was in uh, 1630. Was anyone alive then? No. Okay. If so, I wanted your diet. Um, that a philosopher named Rene Descartes wrote these words in the Latin. Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. These words have stood the test of time. And as he was writing this, as philosophers do, they, they're trying to prove something and, it, and it's really heady. And, it, and it's something that like, it's a couple words, but it's really profound. And one of the profound things that, that he was using and figuring out in there is that our thoughts prove our existence. If, if you cannot think, you, you don't exist. And, and so, uh, because we think we exist. And also our thought life is directly tied into our identity. It's tied into all of our existence. It's tied into our physical bodies. It's tied into who we become, what we're going to do inside of our lives. There's a quote that I had hanging in my apartment uh, way back in college uh, that talked about uh, these words. And I always, uh, I thought about them and they resonated with me. I have no clue who actually wrote them. I did a lot of Google searching and it's like one of those that everyone keeps stealing it. Uh, but they might be familiar to you. It says, watch your thoughts, they become your words. Watch your words, they become your actions. Watch your actions, they become your habits. Watch your habits, they become your character and watch your character for it becomes your destiny. 
Scientists, they've discovered how, how incredibly important our thought life is. Like what is happening inside of our brains, the things that we think about, it, it causes shifts inside of our brain chemistry that causes things like stress and anxiety and all of those types of things inside of our lives. A lot of what they assign people that are going through these real battles are medications to help maybe set this up right, to help function and, and change some of that brain chemistry to be able to think differently. That, that's their goal inside of this. And so scientists, as they've studied the brain and they've studied how it connects to the entire human body and stress, they, they know that it has real effects on our lives. It has real physical effects on how we go through life. Some of the side effects of even just stress that's caused from our thought life that moves into our lives as we begin to think about things are migraines, headaches, high blood pressure, stomach aches, chest pain, constipation, and the opposite, diarrhea. It's just fun to say in a sermon. Um, insomnia, loss of energy, reduced sex drive. All of these things, they begin way before the, that, the symptoms. They begin in our brain, in our thought life, and in where we're going. It, it begins in what we're setting our minds to. So the reality of our thought life is, is that uh, good thoughts bear good fruit and bad thoughts bear bad fruit. And guess what? You're the gardener. Good thoughts bear good fruit, bad thoughts bear bad fruit, and you're the gardener. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 7, 18. He says, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear bad fruit. See, what goes out can only be what comes in. What goes out of our lives can only be what comes in. And that's why Paul is, is imploring us to think about a certain set of virtues because he wants that to come out of our lives. But uh, Paul, he, he understands this. The guy understands philosophy and he understands the culture and, and he knows that this set of, of things that he's giving these people in verse eight, that whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right and pure and lovely and admirable, excellent and praiseworthy, he knows that in that society, in that stoic Greek philosoph philosophical society, that no one was gonna argue with those things. Like all of the things that Paul's saying there, they make sense. Even today, uh, thousands of years later, these things make sense. Like if we could do this, if we could, if we could somehow all of us align our minds around this kind of stuff, then, then we'd find maybe hope in the world. We'd find maybe more joy. We'd find more truth in the world and, and more noble stuff and more stuff in our world worth celebrating and admiring. It's not just a, a thought life of be happy. Put a fake smile on your face. It, just, just think happy thoughts. It's not like, hey, uh, think about this equation, seven plus seven equals 14. It's not that kind of thinking. It's not like when you're trying to like tell your kids, hey, just picture that big bowl of broccoli like it's a big bowl of ice cream, buddy, and it's gonna change everything. It doesn't work, I've tried it, trust me. And I'll probably continue to, but that's not what he's saying. He's like, you need to have your thought life right because this stuff is huge on your destiny. It, it's huge on who you become as a person in your life. Paul understands all of these things. But there becomes a, a, a kind of an issue as I begin to, to think through these words is we have to try to think of who gets to decide those definitions. Who gets to decide what is true, what is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy? Do we just take a poll on Facebook? Who gets to decide that kind of stuff? I'll tell you like who often gets to decide that kind of stuff in our world, me. It's probably the same in your life. When it, when it comes down to it, you're the one who gets to decide oftentimes all of these things. And then you get to, you know, give that definition to everybody. And if someone doesn't line up with that definition, then they are not those things. And then it's a bigger problem because, you know, in the three decades that I've lived, those things have changed. <laughs> what I thought was noble at 18 is not noble at 33. What I thought was admirable and excellent and praiseworthy, they, they're really not. <laughs> The older I get, I, I still love the Huskers and their run in the 1990s, but you know, the older I get, the more I, I realize that I shouldn't devote my entire life to this. I get stressed and I bite my nails and it's not praiseworthy or excellent. 
And so even in my own life, I do not have unity over what these things are. And then you add other people to the mix, a spouse or a kid or a, a coworker or a teammate or a, a political figure to, to how do we define these things? And it is just a jumbled mess. And that leads us to where we are in most of our lives. How do we, what's truth? Should I do it? Should I not do it? And, and that's where the problem comes from. And so today we have to decide how we figure out what truth is, how we figure out what is right and lovely and pure and admirable and excellent. And today I want to submit to you that there's a place we have to do this appraisal. It's the foot of the cross. We have to begin this uh, appraisal of what all those things are at the foot of the cross, because the reality is we are not any of those. (laughs) That's what the foot of the cross tells us. The, the ground is level there, and we have to come to a realization that we are not any of those things. We look at the, the grand scheme of our lives, and we have failed to do those things. We have failed to be just and, and noble and pure and truthful all of the time. And then we get to look into the face of Jesus, who is those things, who, who came and walked on this planet and said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And all of these things, they stem out of truth. And we have to realize, hey, Jesus, he's the standard. Jesus is the standard for all of these things. And we begin to look at his life. It's at the foot of the cross. We realize that we are but dust, but God. (laughs) We are but dust, but God. That's where our lives intersect with, with the creator of the universe. We are no good. Our lives are no good. But God intersects with our lives and he provides us a new identity. And this becomes really, really good news. And and the God that we serve is not a distant God way up in the cosmos eating his popcorn. Like, are they going to get this figured out? No, he's a God who became Emmanuel, God with us, who came and lived on this planet to show us what it looks like to live a life that is true, that is excellent, that is praiseworthy, that is noble, that is all of these things. And so where do we begin to look for defining these things? We look to Jesus. We look at his life and and how he lives. Paul, throughout this entire letter, he he keeps pointing to a a few different things. He points to humility and he, he points to unity. Paul's writing this to a church that he wants to be powerful, a powerful church that's united. And he knows the only way to have a powerful church is how to, is to have a united church. And the only way to have a united church is to have a humble church. Like not just like everybody, but like everybody has to be humble. And so Paul really in in verse eight, he wants us to consider these things. I'll say it this way. Take aim at your thoughts because your thoughts aim you. We have to take aim at the things that we're thinking about because the things we're thinking about aim us in life. (laughs) They can aim us one or two directions or multiple directions, but when we think about the things that are right and pure, when we think about the things that are lovely, when we think about Jesus, our lives begin to look more and more and more like Jesus. And so Paul says that in verse eight, and then in verse nine, after the thinking portion, he says, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. So now we ask the question, what did, what do, what did we learn from Paul? What does the early church learn from Paul? What's the rest of this letter? We get to the finally, but what's he talking about before this to come to the conclusion? Paul, oftentimes in these letters, he would say, follow me as I follow Christ. He said that earlier in chapter three, he's like, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so what does that look like? What is Paul pointing us to? And and again, what Paul is pointing to, what the theme of this letter is, is humility and unity. So the gals he wrote to the, the, the week before or the last week, what Mark talked about was you have to have unity and unity only happens when we are humble. He writes, have the same mind of Christ. And so Paul, he has this whole entire thing in chapter three where he's like, guys, check out my resume. My resume is so awesome. I'm such a brainiac. I am born in the right family, in the right culture. All of this stuff, circumcised on the, on the right day. This is really, really good. And then he's like, it's trash. <laughs> None of it means anything. He realizes I am but dust. 
And then he says, but God, but God has given me righteousness and I don't boast in anything I've accomplished, but I boast in God. And this is really good news. Paul helps us see that unity problems are always humility problems. Unity problems are always humility problems. But there's a great hope, friends, because we have a really good God who, I, like I said earlier, modeled these things for us, who came and lived. He, he left uh, uh, the cul-de-sac that he was living in and a nice life in heaven and came to be a person, which we read in chapter two, who, who came and humbled himself, became a servant, and he was obedient to, to God, even to death on a cross. <laughs> This is good news that, that the God of the universe didn't just watch from a distance and hope we figure it out, but he came and he modeled this way. And, and Paul's saying, hey, I'm modeling my life after Christ and you should do the same. Like that Christ who uh, that night washed those feet, even the one who would betray him. That Christ who walked towards sinners, towards the people with diseases and sicknesses that everybody wanted to avoid. That Christ in that humility the one who went out of his way to be with messy people in humility, that Christ, model that kind of life. And then you will get a picture of what is true, what is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, whatever is excellent or praiseworthy. See, all of that is found in the person of Jesus, the way, the truth, the life. That's why the mission of the church is to make disciples of who? Jesus. Not make disciples of Alex or not make disciples of Paul or Sally or, or, or Jimmy or whatever your name is. It's to make disciples of Jesus. We're, we're supposed to be following him. That's what discipleship looks like. It's why our our command is to go and tell all the world about Jesus, baptize them in the name of, not you, in the name of Jesus, to make followers of Jesus and following Jesus equals humility. Living lives that are this way. One of my favorite authors, his his name is Bob. He, He talks about sometimes our pursuit of discipleship like this. He says, our problem following Jesus is we're trying to be a better version of us rather than a more accurate reflection of him. But to become a a, a more accurate reflection of him, we have to look at his life and we have to consider these things. We have to, to consider, meditate over these things, meditate over who Christ is. We have to spend time with Christ to become a more accurate reflection of him. We have to put those things into our lives for those things to come out of our lives. We have to eat the daily bread that he talks about in Matthew 4, 4. That's the only thing that's going to sustain us. We have to to dive into the living water so that our our thirst is forever quenched. We have to do all of those things. And that's why I said that the only place that we can make a proper sound appraisal of our lives is at the foot of the cross and in the face of Jesus. First, it's really bad news, but then it's really, really good news because he traded places with us. He he gave us his righteousness. He gave us his glory, but we first have to admit we're a mess and in need of a savior. We're in need of a life raft. Otherwise, we're just people out there in the ocean drowning in our sin. But it's that moment that we wave our hand. We're like, I need that. He comes and he rescues us. And this is really good news. Because most of the time when I do like an appraisal, it ends up with me in some kind of prideful place. Like I'm like, well, I'm better than others. Like I I know a lot of scripture and I I work in the church and like I fight with my wife less than this guy fights with his wife. And you know, I'm a more responsible employee. I put in more hours or I'm a better dad. I coach all of their sports or all of these things. And usually when I do self appraisals, they end up in a prideful place. Or for some people, when you do a self-appraisal, it's the opposite. Maybe you end up in a place where you're like, man, I'm no good. I survey my life and the mistakes I've made and how I treat people and where I've been and the things I've done. And, and the other way we do self-appraisals is just to, man, I'm, I'm no good. But for me, since I land on the pride side of self-appraisal, I wanna talk about what that looks like in my life. Because my pride gets me in all sorts of messes. 
My pride gets me in a mess when I'm coaching a coach pitch and I think that it was a strike and, and it was a uh, call the ball and I, I want to yell at like a 14 year old umpire last Sunday when I'm playing kickball with a bunch of adults and, and I think that I threw the ball and I got him out and everyone says I didn't. And, I, and what wants to well up in me is, is pride and, and anger. <laughs> and then I start to think, well, I'm not as bad as that guy. If he wasn't just dumb in the first place, then none of this would have happened. I'd venture to say that if you surveyed the last like five points in your life of contention, arguments with a spouse, coworker, uh, that fight you're on on Facebook that you just won't give up and you have to be right on, um, that there's probably a, a thing that's in the middle of all of those. You could probably diagnose the issue and it's your pride. I know for some people you're like, oh no, 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 it's their pride. <laughs> that's your pride. <laughs> there's some people like, no, there is no, I, Dude, you are off your rocker. There is no pride. And, and for that, I, I don't even have time to address inside of this message, but it's your pride. See, it takes great humility to follow Jesus. It takes surrendering our resume, our identities. It, it takes surrendering all the things that we think did something to accomplish something to follow a Jesus, the only one who is pure and lovely and right and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy. Over and over in scripture, we find these things, but there is a real enemy, friends. And they're not sitting next to you. They're not sitting in another room chatting with you on Facebook. They're not in your family. There's a real enemy. And there's a real war and he's trying to fight this battle with lies. His name is Satan and he's, he's done the same thing for like his entire run. He, he tries to convince people that God's plans are not as good as God's plans are. He tries to convince people that God is a buzzkill who just wants to constrain your life. And if you do the things the way God wants you to do things, your life is gonna be lame, it's gonna be boring and it's not gonna be any good. His, his name is Satan. We, we saw his first move. He showed it to us in the garden when he walked up to Eve who had access to everything they could ever want or long for or imagine. And he says, hey, psst, God's holding something back. The fact that he, he constrained something from you, the fact that God said, hey, that's not good for you. It's just because he's a buzzkill. He doesn't want you to have a good life. And, and that's what Satan wants to try to do to us in our lives today. But we realize the more older we get or the more wise we get, the more the spirit fills our lives, that the only way to freedom is constraint. And my marriage, my parenting, my job, everything about me would be a wreck if I did whatever I wanted. If I gave into every urge that I have, every urge, every thought that's bad, every sexual desire that I have, if I give into all of those things, my life would be a wreck. And so I have to go to a place that, that gives me truth and says, how should I live life to actually have freedom? And that's what this book, it gives us constraint to give us freedom. Most often the things that we're chasing for freedom are the things that put us in shackles. And so friends, Paul wants us to have freedom and freedom is found in understanding God's plan and constraint in our lives. But sometimes our pride gets in the way and there's one way to get out. Only humility can get us out of the mess that pride got us into. You're, you, maybe you're trying to think of another way. You're in the middle of a fight with somebody and you're Googling all of the research and all of the answers or, or you're just thinking about how do you respond to this person? No, humility. It's the only way to get you out of the mess that pride got you into. It's the only way that gets us out of the mess of sin that our pride got us into. Admitting our need for a savior. It's the only way out of a mess. It's what Paul modeled. It's, it's what Paul invites us to follow him as he follows Jesus. It's what Jesus modeled. I want to bring us back to that refrigerator for a second and how this affects our lives. The reason the eggs weren't in the refrigerator, we didn't put them in there. No matter how much we planned to put them in there, no matter how much we thought we put them in there, no matter how much we were convinced we put them in there, we didn't. And so when we went to go find them, they weren't there. 
I do this in my life a lot. I'm like, oh, gosh, I have every intention to wake up early, to spend time in Jesus's word. I have every intention of, you know, reading bedtime stories that involve Jesus to my kid every night, but I'm tired. I have every te- intention to meditate on scripture and make sure every day I, I get a, a piece of that, that living water and that daily bread in my life. But man, I love watching sports. Or man, I love watching throwback sports because they're not actually on or reading articles about when sports might actually start again. I love listening to podcasts too much. I love this music too much. I love this or that too much. And then my friends and my neighbors and my coworkers, their lives are a mess. They come to me looking for living water. I open it up. It's not there. I haven't put it in in a while. And they're panting and I I don't have anything. So what do I do? Hold on, just give me a second. Google, Pastor Google. Um, You said, what were you going through? Oh, you're really sad? Bible verses on sadness. Hey, um, no, no, that's not not what it means to meditate on these things, to spend time with Jesus. But it becomes our default, it becomes my default even in life to meditate on these things, to to spend time with Jesus. Meditating means you're not doing all the talking. So maybe it it begins in your prayer life to go sit with Jesus and ask, is he worthy? God, show me where you've been worthy and faithful in my life. I'm not gonna talk about it. I'm just gonna sit and let you speak for a second. I'm gonna actually meditate on your word and the truths that you say in your word about me, even when it feels totally the opposite. I'm gonna find my peace in you and nothing else. Friends, what goes out can only be what comes in. Our refrigerators, our bank accounts, our minds, and our hearts. You wanna live this stuff out? Do you you really want to be a person whose life is marked by these virtues? Think about them. Spend time with Jesus, choose humility. It's the meditation on the promises of the gospel, the good news of the gospel that are found only in Jesus that bring God's presence to our life. Maybe you're like thinking, man, I have not sensed God's presence in like months because I haven't been able to go to that building. No, uh, the presence of God is found with God, meditating with God, spending time with God. Spend time with God and there you will find his presence. Or you wanna live a life that is full of anxiety and anger and security and significance, I have a recipe for you as well. Don't meditate on these things. It's simple, just don't do it. Don't consider Jesus, don't follow him in humility, just keep choosing pride. You really love conflict, keep choosing pride. You really wanna have no peace, keep choosing pride. Don't think about these things, don't think about Jesus, think about you. So here's a question I just want us to ponder quickly today. Just think about, survey your last like five conversations with people on social media, via text message, with a coworker, with your neighbor, your spouse, your kids, whoever it might be, just survey them. Give yourself some time. Think about what's coming out of those conversations. Is what's coming out of those conversations something that's true, noble, pure, right? Are your thoughts and deeds reflecting what Christ has done? When someone disagrees with you, is your identity threatened? Because your identity might be misplaced. When was the last time you got so mad and you were struggling with forgiveness and, and bitterness And then you considered a great God who while you were a sinner died for you. Who there was a great chasm between you and him and he came and rectified and reconciled that and forgave you so that on your worst day, you could have life. So that your identity is no longer placed in you, but it's placed in the righteousness of God. 
When was the last time you pondered those things? Friends, let's not forget these last verses and last words in verse nine. And the God of peace will be with you. Last question, what are you hitching your peace to? Has your life been rocked financially lately? You've gotten a call from a doctor. Have you lost a job? Have you been debating about what's right and wrong on Facebook? Are you hitching your peace to your prosperity? Are you hitching your peace to a past, present, or future politician? Are, are, are you hitching your peace to an economy? Let, let me tell you the, the history of the world from, these Philipp, from the, the Philippians all the way to now. It's all gone under. The power, the influence, the, these countries, the structures that were there, it has all failed. And so Paul was saying, this church, it was gonna get messy. It wasn't gonna be calm. He's saying, hit your peace to Jesus. Not all those plastic things. Are you hitching your peace to Jesus or something plastic? When these things happen to you, are you totally thrown for a loop? Is, is your life feeling like it's spiraling out of control? You might be hitching your peace to something that's plastic. Is all of your time and all of your energy put towards debating someone over who a politician could be, then you might be hitching your peace to something that's plastic. Friends, you want to have peace in November, no matter who gets elected. Friends, you want to have peace no matter what happens to your bank account. Friends, you want to have peace no matter what calls you get from a doctor. Hitch your peace to Jesus. What goes in can only be what comes out. I'm gonna pray. The band's gonna just come up and sing just a quick reprise of a song. And I just want you to stand, sit, whatever you do to consider that thought. Are you hitching your peace to true peace? <laughs> whatever's true, whatever's lovely, whatever's noble, pure, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy. Jesus, thanks that you are good that you are truth. And God, I have hitched my peace to things that are plastic. Far too often I do, and then the whole world rocks my boat and, and I, I, I let that drive my life. But Jesus, would I hitch my peace to you? <laughs> Jesus, would we hitch our peace to you? Would we do this in humility? Then we could find unity and then the church can be that powerful entity that you said would not be killed by the gates of hell. Nothing would stop it. God, we know how the story ends, so would we hitch our peace to you? Pray this and ask this in your holy, humble name. Amen.